Firstly, thank you so much for having me and thanks for coming guys. We're going to be talking about all things online privacy and uh, tonight we'll be talking about our trust in two different parts. Like how we can trust the internet, who we can trust. So I want you guys to get involved. Uh, if you feel like you want to say something, there will be the opportunity. Um, okay, so we've got more panellists to join us. But at the moment I'd like to introduce to you <coughs> Emma Carr. Hello. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do and why you are an expert in your field. Wow, okay, so as I said, my name is Emma Kai. I'm from, originally from County Durham, uh, and I work at Big Brother Watch, which is a very small civil liberties and privacy campaign group which is based in Westminster. And basically we look at our privacy and civil liberties both in our online world and our offline world. Uh, I'm ready to learn from you, <laughs> but right now we've got some more food for thought in the form of a short video piece. If you are a law-abiding citizen of this country, going about your business and your personal life, you have nothing to fear. Uh, nothing to fear about the British state or intelligence agencies listening to your f the contents of your phone calls or anything like that. Indeed, you'll never be aware of all the things those agencies are doing. It shouldn't be if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. It should be innocent until proven guilty. I mean, that is the bedrock of what our uh, democratic state is based on. And so I think that, you know, you should be able to uh, communicate and certainly walk out of your front door without being suspected of committing a crime or suspect that you were going to commit a crime. So I think, I mean, that would be my first reaction to, to William Hague, but I think you absolutely can have, you, can, you have to have security and liberty um, in conjunction with each other, and it's up to everybody in that community, in that country, to decide where you place the line between security and liberty. I mean, I, I totally back uh, GCHQ, MI5 and MI6 in doing their jobs. There are bad guys out there, and we need to make sure that they're doing their job to stop them from committing crimes and potentially hurting us. But society should know what it is that they're doing to protect us. It shouldn't be, trust us, we're going to go away here and not tell you what's going on. Exactly as how William Hague said, we should be questioning what it is that they're doing and whether it is actually keeping us safer. And in terms of the law, what does the law say on the matter? I mean, the, the first problem that we have is that the majority of our laws to do with kind of privacy and data protection and surveillance were created before the majority of us were using the internet, certainly as, as the way we're using it at the minute. So the surveillance legislation in this country was created in 2000. So that's way before kind of Facebook and Google was still in a garage. We weren't tweeting, we didn't have geolocation on our phone, we didn't really use text messages. Everything's become so much more sophisticated and we're handing over so much more data that the safeguards just simply aren't there to protect us as they were when we were all using landline telephones. So the first thing that we think should be done is to update the legislation to make it fit for the digital age. And you'd think that would be a very simple uh, process that everybody could get behind, but unfortunately a lot of people just don't see it that way. I mean, I, I recently spoke at the Liberal Democrat uh, Spring Conference on creating a digital bill of rights um, to mark the 800 year anniversary for the Magna Carta. And so that's something that I'm really passionate about as well, creating something that says, okay, we shouldn't be treated any differently just because our communications are online, as, as if, you know, I was to say something to you offline, why should they be treated any differently? So I think that's something that we really want to progress and the only way we can do that is if we have guys like you demanding that from our politicians. So I think the balance in terms of A, the data that we're now sharing about ourselves because of our online communications and the, the lack of power and understanding we have about how that's being used just kind of completely tips the scale in terms of the balance between the state and the individual. So would it be fair to say more conversation like, conversations like this need to happen and that um, we all need to educate ourselves and equip ourselves for the future of privacy online. Absolutely, I think we all need to question both the kind of the, the government and of private companies about why are they asking for that information? Who is going to access it and what are they going to do with it? And I think part of the problem with our everyday lives is that it's so data driven. And you have to remember data is now a commodity. It's, data is a valuable thing that is sold on. So when we pass that on, we have to question why it is that we're doing that. I'd love to know what some of you guys think. When you kind of phrase it like this, it does count, sound really extreme and a bit stupid and very, you know, big brothery. Do you think that the argument that it is about our safety and to protect us from terrorism or whatever is the truth? Or do you think there's a more sinister agenda at work here about just keeping tabs on everyone for the hell of it because that makes us easier to control as a population? 
I'm jumping and one goes to work in GCHD, you know, they don't wake up every morning kind of rubbing their hands with glee and with kind of malicious intention. They're not cackling away. I think, but I think we have to be careful about what powers and what tools we hand over to uh, the people who have the ability to monitor us. We have to question that. They're going to use whatever tools they have available to try and stop the bad guys. I don't think there is necessarily malicious intentions out there. Um, but we have to be careful what powers we are giving them and make sure that they're proportionate to the threat that is actually to us as individuals and to our community. Do not get me wrong, I use all of the things that are kind of supposedly actively monitored by GCHQ and, and companies selling on data and things, but I do that feeling like I'm in the knowledge of what it is that is going on. And it's about educating ourselves and, and people being transparent about what it is they're doing. But the internet is an amazing thing and has, has so much power to help people. And I think we need to hear much more about that side of things. So are we going to change the panel over and actually talk a bit about it more personally? Thank you so much, Emma, everyone. <laughs> I'd like to introduce to the panel Hannah Flynn and Claudia Andrew. Hello. Hello. Um, would you like to start by telling everyone why you are an expert? Okay, you can start. Okay. Um, <laughs> my name is Claudia Andrew. I'm 19 and I'm a young social media journalist, I call myself. I run a blog a couple of years ago about the Olympics. My name's Hannah Flynn. I work for the NSPCC. We provide the service called Childline. Who knows what Childline is? Everybody smiling, nodding. Did you know that the majority of people who contact Childline are over 11? Older than 11? A third of them last year that talked to us were 16 to 18 years old. It's quite, I think that's quite surprising. Yeah. Um, just to put in your mind why I'm sitting here, and we're not, we're not talking about six-year-olds who are too scared to pick up the phone, we're talking about people who are practically old enough to vote. Um, Childline is free, it's confidential, importantly for today, 24 hours a day, online and on the phone. And last year we had more contacts online than we did on the phone for the first time ever. So it's really important to us that we're trusted I think you have to be very vigilant. So when a little box pop up, you know, saying that your privacy settings have changed, you can't just disregard it. You need to go and have a look. You need to spend some time and go through the settings. As boring as it is, you need to do that if you want to be kept safe. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I think in terms of trust on the internet, the only person you can actually trust in the end is yourself. Yeah. You definitely. have to develop your instincts and rely on yourself to get it right. Um, you can't trust the platforms that you're on because they can change their terms at any second, they can do what they want with your content, but providing that you're aware of everything that you're doing, and mm. that's really hard, but I think mm. you have to try, um, then, then you have to keep perpetuating kind of a digital existence because there isn't really another option. It's really granular in that way. So it's, it's an individual on a device that's in their pocket or in, on their laptop, in their bedroom, or on their tablet. Mobile phone ownership between 11 to 18 is now something like 95%. 80% of people 11 to 18 have a smartphone that can take pictures. So it's not that you have to go on the shared family computer anymore. You are, you're completely free to do exactly what you want. And also the internet that you have is your own. So you, you follow the right people that you want to follow on Tumblr. You follow who you want to follow on Twitter. So you're, you're completely isolated in this really personalised experience and it can feel really safe. Mm. But it might it's not be. not. Um, I'd love for you guys to ask us some questions. I asked some people in my school about what they thought about changing passwords on social networking sites and actually only one in like six people said that they changed their passwords regularly on social networking sites. And also they asked about whether they trust the internet and the media and the technology. All of them said no and ironically the teenagers who use internet every day. Um, I was just wondering, how do you make young people, teenagers especially, care? Because a lot of, most teenagers go on the internet, what, like for the majority of when they get home from school or whatever, but they don't really think about what they're going on and I know, like me, a lot of the time I don't really care. Like they ask me all the time, oh, do, you want, do you want to show this? But if I want to go on a website, I'll say yes to whatever they're telling me. And I'll just go on it because I want to go on the website rather than thinking, oh, is it safe? There's so much to care about that actually clicking on a website and just going on it is pretty simple and easy and probably will always be people's first answer is like, I'm just going to do it. Um, I think, sadly, for people to care more, we have to know more about when it's gone wrong. And I think something that we did at Childline last year, we created an app that helps young people deal with the pressure 
um, around sexting and sending naked images to other people. And when we researched that app, we heard from a lot of places, oh yeah, no, I haven't done that, but um, I know a girl at school and she sent a picture and it went around the school and it, she was completely ruined, it completely ruined her social life and she was really depressed. And I know that that happened, but I'm, I'm, you know, I wouldn't do it, but they're going to do it anyway. So I'm not really sure if that answers the question. Um, mm. But the just listening to one another and listening out for people telling you and listening truly to when something's gone wrong and it's really hurt somebody else, thinking about how that could apply to you. It's about control. I mean, the message of our campaign wasn't too much about consequences because mm. people hear about the consequences of smoking and underage drinking all the time. Everybody does it. So that was not going to change people's minds. Mm. It was more about, do you want to keep control yeah. in your life? Yeah. Um, and I think everybody does. I think you've got to stop thinking about it as when you click, you're clicking it and you're the only person that can see what you're clicking on and where you're going to. You've got to think about when you post something online and when you comment about anything online, it's not yours anymore. It belongs to that site and anyone can have a look at it. It doesn't belong to you anymore once you put it up there. Like my, my point kind of ties in, um, but like when is when does anything on the internet die? Like when does it? Yeah. It never deletes. Yeah. So, no, no, so, no, no. Yeah, so my thing is that um, that with this whole data collection, that if the laws were to change in an extreme way in like five or ten or fifteen years time, that so many people would be able to be tried for crimes that weren't crimes before. Yeah. And and how we can stop that from happening and if is it even possible to stop it from happening i think you have to what i was talking about you have to question about what powers you're giving uh our, our politicians in the state and not question about who you're giving the ones now but who might get elected next time who might get elected in 10 years time or not even get elected take power i think one of the I think, problems well, i say problem but one of the issues with the united kingdom is that we've always had a benign government We've never lived in a totalitarian state. We've never been in a state in this country where somebody will knock on your front door and arrest you and potentially kill you for the political ideas that you hold, for your sexual orientation, and, and, and similar things like that. So you have to think, you know, it sounds very dramatic, but there are people across the world who are living with that threat, and they, have, they don't have the freedom to use the internet in the way that we do. And so you have to question, you know, how could that be transferred into, the, into this country and actually do just the risk of that, that happening to us weigh up with the risk of um, you know, the bad guys and how do we get that? So that's the point of security versus liberty. We do need to be responsible for, mm -hmm. for lots of stuff and, and vote and learn about different political parties, ask questions, go to debates like these and then try and engage your friends on just decent conversation when it comes to online privacy and everybody that's meant to be in control of us and sort of take that slightly into our own hands a bit more and, and be a little bit more engaged as, into what's going on. I think we have that responsibility. We can't just be like, we're young and it's hard and we don't care, it's hard for us. Like, it's up for us to change that. Okay, and we've got a final uh, poem from Deanna, thank you. Her boyfriend hung up the phone on her. Said he couldn't hear her, though he sounded clear to her ear. He stuttered his excuse. I can't hear you. You're breaking up. Stand somewhere, anywhere other than where you have chosen to. She obediently lined up. Aiming his name like her one goal game of money up. Her lucky penny. Flicked high, somersaulting through space. Confidently falling head over heels. But it didn't land right. It bounced back, tails up. He hung up. She lay down face up, resigned to read hours, ring rings, ring rings, ring rings ran round, chasing his voicemail, pleading him to shout into her vessel and make echoes bounce around like change. Hollow, she begged his investment to fall in and splash her sides with stories she could use to numb her captive thumbs and soothe silence through his sounds. She craved his dependence like the sweet nothing she'd taste on her tongue in the addictive way that as lovers they kiss passionately in the emptiness of dark streets and long nights that daylight put to sleep. When he called back, closed eyes scratched touch green with gloved finger, aware identity, her identity's prints were to be taken, to be cloned, to be spread. 
but resistance can't exist without vulnerability, so fingertips stripped it tip marker to the right and she picked up. He was too weak to greet her, too fatigued to say her name, blocked up and in need of a prescription. She hadn't heard of their conversation worse than she felt it. In a way her arm trembled from the phone, held in hand, held to head, dead weight she was breathing, forcing life into a corpse. But as she sighed her last, I love you, she saw him whisper, just trust me. Assured she stored those words. Ensured them for four to ensure her alarm would guard. Her alarm flashed light silently nine times when 36 prods from his inquisitive prints obscured the perfect black of their reality. But regardless of how her eyes were stinging brightness, they'd adjust in fast blinks, scattering tones until they found before, beneath. And she would reread, reread, reread. Just trust me. She reread, 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 just trust me as access denied his eleven symbols her sight because his credit had run dry. She rereads, 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 just trust me as she realizes she is signed into a sacred IOU. Idolized his pay as you go as a contract. She rereads, rereads, his small print written in metaphor, rereads, his signature, a duplicate picture of a kiss, just trust. The line cut out after the signal crackled at the last spit. Me. She called. She's calling. She's calling for him to answer. I can't. I can't hear you. We're breaking up. Thank you.